because, because you are enough for us. We cast our cares and trust in your heart for us. Cause your name is great and you are good, so good. And you always keep your promises. your faithfulness Cause your ways of loving us are so high so high your ways of loving us are so high so high your ways of loving us so deep and wide and never will they change how we love Drove with the top down this morning. Is it is it raining? It's snow. Oh, okay, it snows. Okay, snow will kind of not melt into my seats. So, I'm going to open in prayer, and then we're going to get rolling. Nice flowers, dear Father. We thank you so much for the morning and for the opportunity to be together with you and uh, with one another. And I pray, Jesus, that today we would just we would dig into your word, and our hearts would be primed to meet you and to be transformed by you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Saints of 
what's to come, seeing through the moment and through the circumstances into what it is you have for us uh, that's waiting. And Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you dwell in us now and that you speak to us now and you've given us the body of believers, but we thank you even more, Lord God, what we have to look forward to. That you, my God, are our king and you wait for us and you've made a place for us and you will come and get, come, come back and get us. So may we look forward to that, Lord Jesus, with great joy and anticipation. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Do me a favor, if you're a kid, run to the front. If you're not a kid, shake a hand, learn a name, say hello. Good morning, welcome to Mosaic. It is great to have you here this weekend. My name is Heather. If you are a guest with us, there is a white pamphlet in the back of your pew titled Things You Might Want to Know. Go ahead and take a look at that. It'll give you even more information about who we are and what we do. There's also a great connection card, and this is your tool to communicate with us. So if you have a, a need or a question, comment, prayer request, fill it out on that connection card. And once you do that, you can drop it into any one of our giving boxes. They're located out here in the narthex and out each one of these doorways into the main hall. So we'll follow up accordingly from there. Uh, just make a note, there is no Awana or youth group this Wednesday, November 22nd. So enjoy the time uh, and have a happy Thanksgiving. There is no uh, activities on Wednesday night this week. Uh, next, uh, Mosaic Meals is going to be this Friday. I know it says November 14th, but it is in fact this Friday, November 24th, I believe. And so that's going on from 3 to 7 p.m., serving opportunities. So we invite you to join us uh, for Mosaic Meals this Friday. Uh, then, uh, thank you so much for helping us restock the pantry. Just continue to think about that extra item for the month of November. It really makes a huge in a difference and it impacts our neighborhood. And so uh, just bring in that extra item for the whole month long. Uh, thank you for all of the contributions there. It's good to see the pantry full again. Uh, well, great to have you here. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Tony's around here somewhere. I'll go find him. Oh, I'm right there here. There he is. I suppose I should probably show up for work. All right. How we going, guys? How we doing, guys? Are we happy this morning? I got to drive with the top down on my convertible on the way here this morning. It was wonderful. Well, here's the deal. You know, as far as I'm concerned, God made me bald, so there's no reason to me, for me to put a top over it if I'm driving. If it ain't raining... I feel like I'm, oh, glasses, there we go. All right, awesome. Hey, you know what? We're gonna dig into a lot of scripture today. I'm gonna be really, I think I'm gonna be super informal with this group today. So let's just enjoy this. We're gonna dive into some scripture and we're gonna dig in. So I may actually ask questions, so be, be prepared to answer if I ask. You don't have to answer. I might. All right, um, this is, here's what we've been doing. We've been doing, been working on how our, how our lives, our words, our deeds, our speech reflect who we are in Christ. That's essentially what we've been doing, right? So have it being new creation, God has done this incredible thing in us, and doing so, he says, listen, take off the old, put on the new, 
Remove falsehood and speak truthfully. When you speak the truth, speak it in love. When you do so, don't just do it in a loving manner. Make sure that it builds up the, you know, builds up the person you're speaking to. On top of that, he says, as you mature through that, what I want you to do is not only, in a general sense, speak in a way that builds others up, but now get to know the person and love them in such a way as to build them up according to their needs. That takes attention. It takes attentiveness. It takes, it takes consideration. All those things. Those, all those things are expression, you know, true expressions of love and affection. Then it goes on to say, be careful with your anger. You know, so we see all of these things coming out. There's a really neat little verse in, in Ephesians 4 that, bless you, in Ephesians 4 that talks about not grieving the Holy Spirit. So let's take a look at that real quick. You guys are getting bonus time today. So the bills don't play till 4 o'clock, so we've got all day long. All right, so you laugh, but I mean it. Okay, so, well, I should say the bills don't lose until 4 o'clock today. So, um, that has been such a disappointment, but that's another day. All right, so what did I say we're doing? Going to Ephesians, right? Okay. So go to Ephesians 4 just for a second because I want to take a look at this verse. And you guys are the only one getting this verse, all right? The other two, the other two services didn't. I didn't like them very much. You guys are my favorites, so we're going to go here for a minute. And I want to talk about this idea of grieving. And I mentioned this in the Saturday service two weeks ago. Now, first of all, thank, you get a chance. Thank Aaron for picking up the slack last week. He did a phenomenal job. I mean, I texted him at 5.30 in the morning. I got the flu at 1 in the morning. I laid there for four hours thinking, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. You know that oh, no feeling, you know, when you have the flu and you know it's coming. So about 5.30, I finally texted him. I said, dude, call me when you get a second. And he called me about 15 minutes later. I said, you're on, baby, you're on. I went to bed. And I thought maybe I'd come. Because I went to bed about 5.30, quarter to 6. I woke up at 7.30 like somebody had hit me with a bus. I'm like, oh. So that's, yeah. So, but I feel better today. I only lost five pounds. Now, if I could keep it off, that would be fantastic, but not the way I lost it. So here we go. If you're here for the first time, hi, I'm Tony. Okay, so I'm going to pray, then we're going to read. Father, thank you for your word. And I pray, Jesus, you would just, man, just have fun with us today, Lord. Reveal to us in our hearts those things that are wonderfully built and good and righteous because of what you've done and who you are in us, in this new heart you've given us and the spirit you've given us. And Lord, then to reveal to us the things that are not like you, those things that need to be, the things that need to be worked out. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. So it says, we're going to go to verse 29. Uh, which is where we were two weeks ago. It says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up. Now, we, the reason, now, Paul wrote Ephesians in a certain order. And the reason we're going to go, the reason Aaron, I think, did a wonderful job going last week, going back to the heart of the issue, was to remind us that these commands are always, always in reference to what God has done. So we're going to read a verse out of Jeremiah that says that curses the man who tries to do this in his own strength, Right? So we need to recognize these commandments aren't just f for us to do. These commandments are in line with that which God has done in us, and we are enabled by the Spirit to do it. Therefore, we are capable of doing it, not because we have strength in and of ourselves, but because God is strong in us. All right? So we look at this again. It says, don't let an unwholesome or rotten or putrid speech come from your mouth but only that which is helpful for building others up and then according to their needs, that it may benefit not only them but those who listen. And do not, now here it is, ready? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Now I want us to look at this word grieve. Did we look at this two weeks ago? Anybody remember? In this service? I don't think we did. Did we? Ken, you're nodding. Oh, did you? Okay. All right, so I, I won't linger here long. I wasn't going to anyway. But the idea of grieving here is this. Grieving has to do with love. Guilt has to do with law. So the idea of guilt, you know, what God uses guilt for is to say, pang, that was wrong. Shame is the moment we recognize we've done it wrong and we've been exposed. We are not meant to live in guilt or shame. That should then be converted to grief. Grief is the response of a loving heart that's broken another heart or the heart of the beloved. So when it says we grieve the Holy Spirit, what he's saying, when we conduct ourselves, when we speak in a way and our, or, and or our deeds do not match the goodness that we've been made to be and the spirit that is in us, we grieve God's heart. We grieve his heart. Grief brings us back to repentance. 
Break, grief causes us to go to the one we've offended, the one we've hurt, and to apologize and try to make it right. That's what grief does, where guilt drives you away and pushes you away. You're looking at me with a puzzled look. You have a question? Yep. Okay, awesome. All right. You're welcome to ask, by the way. If I see you look puzzled. All right, awesome. All right, so here we go. You ready? So we don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit with which we've been sealed. Now this is really important because what we're going to discover now from this point forward is we're going to look at what that means in terms of having, why we have the Holy Spirit. What, what was God's intentions all the way back in the you know, four, five, six hundred years before Jesus. So do me a favor and open your notes up. We're going to, I'm going to briefly read what we have on the front page of the notes. So Ezekiel 36, which is what Aaron taught from, reveals this struggle that we have, right? The struggle with what we say, these words that come from our mouth. That's, it's not always a word issue. So when he says, don't let anything putrid come from your mouth, when something does, we think, oh, that's a word issue. That's, that's what, well, or, you know, it's, no. What we find is that it's probably a heart issue. Now, that's not to say we don't make mistakes with our words, and it doesn't mean and that, and, and that our words don't always reflect what's in our heart. But the fact of the matter is, is for the most part, what, you know, Jesus said it, he says what's, what comes out of the mouth is, is the outgrowth of what we, and, but he uses a specific word, what we store in the heart, what we allow to reside there, what we store there, right? So what we did last week, or what Aaron did last week, was take you to Ezekiel to look at the condition of the heart of man. So if we read on, it says, Our speech then, even as Christians, is often a matter of the condition of our heart. A heart, though changed by God, that does not always reflect that change. So our heart must be calibrated to that change. And it is ours, in communion with God's spirit and truth, to join him in that calibrating. God promised that he would, he would do for us, essentially, in spite of us. He says, now, where, where Aaron spent time last week was this promise of the I will. I will do this. That God, in, 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 in allowing his name to be seen for what it is, his glory and his holiness, he says, I will do in you what I need to do that my name would not be tarnished by you. And so 20 different times in one chapter in Ezekiel, 20 different times he either says I will, promises that he will do something, or alludes to it. Think about that for a minute. 20 times. And the primary promise was that I will, I will give you a new heart. I will give you a new spirit. I will be your God. You will be my children, my people. God says, I will do this. He will do it for his name's sake, and we will be the beneficiaries of it. That is God's promise. So you can read the rest of that on your own. We're going to go into the scriptures. So I need to turn to Jeremiah. What we're going to do is build this, this case for the, for the condition of the heart. All right, so I need you to turn to Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah's in the New Testament, old, excuse me, Old Testament. Ay, ay, ay. If you go around to the middle and you find Isaiah, usually Psalm, Proverbs, you know, Song of Solomon, you know, up through Isaiah is pretty easy to find because it's near the center of your Bible. Keep going to the right and you're going to find Jeremiah. And you were in Ezekiel last week, so it's a couple books before Ezekiel. We're at chapter 17, verse 5. I'm going to pray before we read. Father, we thank you for your grace, your word, your power, your love. Just move through us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we're in Jeremiah 17. We're going to start at verse 5. And we're going to, there are a couple things we're going to set up here. It says, this is what the Lord says. This is what God says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man. Cursed is the one who puts his trust in strength. Or trust in flesh who draws strength from mere flesh and whose heart turns away from the Lord. So relying on self or relying on man or relying on man's wisdom and ways, relying on the world, curses that man. And in doing so, when we go that way, we, we automatically turn our back on God. We, we turn around and we face the other way. So look what it says here again. This is what the Lord said, curses the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, whose heart turns away from the Lord, that person will be like a bush in the wasteland. They will not see prosperity when it comes. Even if prosperity comes, or when it comes, it says, you will not be able to see it or grasp it. It doesn't mean prosperity isn't there. It means that it will run through your hands, run through your fingers like sand. You cannot hold on to your prosperity. That person will be like a bush in the wasteland. They will not see prosperity. Look at what it says, when it comes. 
They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. They will be isolated and alone. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Happy is that one who puts his trust in God, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted in the water, by the water that sends its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought, for it never fails to bear fruit. So let's stop for a minute. We're looking at the heart as the condition of the heart, and the condition of the heart has everything to do with where, where we plant ourselves. If we plant ourselves in, in recognizing, if, if we go the, the way of man and we put our trust in the wisdom of man, the strength of man, or the strength of our own flesh, what we do is we place that tree in a spot where there's no water and there's no stream and the, there will be no fruit born. And even if prosperity dump, does come, we will not be able to see it, to hold on to it. We won't be able to, to take advantage of that. It'll slip through our hands like sand through our fingers. And on top of that, we will not bear fruit. I'm reluctant to, to uh, I told the story last night, I don't think I dare tell today. Okay, so here we go. So, I'll, I'll, I'll tell it anyway. Okay, so I love, I, you know, I grew up in the vineyards, I grew up in the orchards, and in my backyard, although it's tiny, I have many fruit trees. So I have cherry trees and peach trees and apple trees, and I had this one particular apple tree that did really, really well. Beautiful shape, it's a dwarf, beautiful shape, and it was trimmed really nicely, it was nice and healthy, and I transplanted it from my grapes because my grapes were going into it, and so I moved it to another spot on the, in the yard, which was a new spot, and it had like 50, tree, 50 apples on it. That's the nice thing about cicadas, they're natural, they're God's way to trim trees, and you know, your produce it like will grow a third more fruit the next year after a cicada year. So I was really excited about seeing it come. And I put this tree at the corner of this, you know, the corner of the patio, and I'm all excited about it, and I'm taking care of it. And, 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 and what I didn't realize, I don't know why I didn't think of this, dogs mark new things. So I have this incredible tree with like 50 apples on it, beautiful, I mean, it's just absolutely gorgeous. And all of a sudden I begin to realize about a month after I move it that the leaves are starting to curl up and the fruit's beginning to shrivel. I'm thinking, what in the world is happening in my tree? So I dug it up a little bit and I fertilized it and I made sure I watered it really well and I thought that should help and I, you know, and I did, you know, didn't pay attention to it for a couple of weeks and I went back to look and it's still getting worse and now they're turning brown and spotty and curling up and the fruit's getting worse and worse. You know what was happening? <laughs> my dog was peeing on it twice a day. Oh yeah, and a dwarf tree can't take that. It's like its main diet was dog. Not great. Here's the thing about our hearts. Our hearts will bear the type of fruit, the fruit that our heart bears will be commensurate to that which we use to water it. And that's what God is saying here. When we rely on our flesh, our own strength, when we rely on the wisdom of man and the ways of the world, what happens is we water our tree with things that are not going to allow it to bear fruit. And in fact, it will begin to wilt. If anybody knows anything about dog marking, the, pri the primary element in it is saline or sodium, which is death to any plant. What does it say here? Look what it says. Curse the one who trusts in man, who draws his strength from flesh, whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity. When it comes, they will dwell in parched places of the desert in a what? Mm, in a salt land. So not only will it not have life, but what life it has will be sucked from it. And that's what happens when we put our trust in man. On the other hand, those who put their trust in the Lord will be like one planted right by the stream. And it doesn't fear anything. Its leaves are always green and it bears fruit. Look at verse 9 now. It says, the heart is deceitful above all, above, uh, uh, the heart is deceitful above all things the heart is deceitful above all things. Now, why, why is he putting that verse right there? It seems a little out of order. Well, it's just a little out of place. Well, this is what I think. I think it's really difficult for us to discern what, what it is we're putting our trust in. That our heart can be deceived when, it, when, it's, when it's putting its trust in man. It can be deceived to think that it's actually putting its trust in God. 
Let me give an example. Okay, so we have this idea now that what comes out of our mouth is the expression of what's inside of our heart. Jesus said that out of the, out of the mouth flows what's stored inside the heart. And so an evil man will bring evil out of their mouth of what's stored in their heart and the good man good what's, that's stored in their, mouth, <clears throat> in their heart. So if, where was I? What was I talking about? Oh, so, the, okay, all right, so let's say Ken and I are, come here, Ken, I'm going to pick on you for a minute. Ken's a friend of mine, and you're not, you're just a prop, but I need a prop right now. Okay, so here's the deal. This is, Ken's a friend of mine, and I like Ken most of the time, but every once in a while, Ken does something that I don't like very much, and what happens is something rises up in me to want to say something to Ken, but generally speaking, it rises up in me in such a way that if I were to say it the way I felt it, it probably wouldn't go very well. And so what I do is, as I, as I meet with Ken, and most of the time it's okay, but every once in a while something about him is just annoying the living daylights out of me, and it rises up, and I stop it right there. I stop it. And I walk away, and Ken thinks he's okay. I think I'm okay. And I go, whoo, man, I exercised self-control that time. I didn't say to Ken what I really wanted to say to Ken. And I go, victory, right? Victory. But is that really victory? Am I actually being honest with Ken? And listen, am I being honest with myself? See, we can convince ourselves that that self-control to not say something to hurt him was an act of the Spirit when in fact all it was was me clenching my flesh. Because I'll tell you what obedience to the Spirit does in this moment. Obedience to the Spirit, and this is, this is where we're heading with all of this. This idea of putting away falsehood and speaking, you know, and speaking the truth. This idea of, of, of not letting putrid things come out of our mouth, but only what is build, helpful for building them up, and then according to his need that benefit those who listen. The fact of the matter is, is that's not always what comes from my mouth. Sometimes it is putrid. Sometimes it is garbage. Sometimes it is anger. Sometimes, sometimes I grieve the Holy Spirit with what comes out of my mouth. But sometimes... I don't realize I'm grieving the Holy Spirit even if I keep it inside my mouth and I just bury it back down in my heart. Because the t- key term here is this, what we store in our hearts. It'll come out of what we store. You know what I like about the word store? It's a very intentional word. You know why I store things? In my garage, in my basement, in my closets, right? On shelves, usually fairly neat, usually. I store it because I want to use it when? Later. Oh, Oh, oh. So, if I'm having a conversation with Ken and something rises up in me that I want to say and I hold it back and I walk away and I just pat, pat myself on the back saying, man, that was an awesome exib- a- a- um, exhibition of the Holy Spirit's gift or fruit of the Holy Spirit, you know, self-control. I'm thinking, all right, I made it. And I walk away. But what have I done with what I was thinking or what I was tempted to say or what I was feeling? Have I dealt with it? Or have I just put it back in storage? Oh. So you know what happens after a while if Ken and I continue to be friends and we continue to kind of irritate each other a little bit but we've only put it in storage and we've not truly dealt with what needs to be dealt with? We've deceived ourselves into thinking that we were being spiritual when in fact we weren't. We were being fleshy. And that fleshiness was my putting back in storage the very things that I really needed to go to the Holy Spirit and say, I'm in trouble. There's something in me whether it's about Ken or whether it's about me and Ken or it's really about me that something, that, you know, it's not Ken's fault, but he brings it out or the relationship brings it out or the circumstances we find ourselves bring it out. And, and so the spiritual thing, the spiritual man doesn't just put it back in storage. Thank you, Ken. What the spiritual man does then is submit that to the, listen, to the truth. What the spiritual man does then is recognizing that either something came from their mouth and so they go and apologize for hurting the person and then they walk away and they go, that's not done just because I asked her forgiveness. Now I've got to go ask God's forgiveness. But listen, it's not done when I ask God for forgiveness either. It's not done until I do this. It's not done until I go back to God and say, listen, I don't know what was there, Lord. There's something in my heart that made me think it was okay for me to feel that way, for me to think those things, for me to say those things, and I need it out. Show me your truth. I think the reason the verse here that says the heart is deceitful above all else and beyond cure is because we fool ourselves into thinking we've done a spiritual thing when we haven't, number one. And then number two, we think it's done once we've done it. And number three, because we've gone by man's wisdom in the world's way, in the way of the flesh, our heart is literally now beyond cure. I can't fix my own heart. 
Only God can fix my heart. But only God can fix my heart when? When I submit it to him. When I say, here it is. Now, we have to understand that we're reading an Old Testament passage, and so we've got a, we've got a mixed metaphor here. Because in salvation, I've been given a new heart. Let's keep going. So we go now to verse 9. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? This is almost like a plea. But then he goes on, the Lord, the, I the Lord, God says, now I the Lord do what? I search the heart. I search the, the, that storage place, and I'm going to show you what's in there. Look at what it says. I search the heart and examine the what? The mind. To reward each person according to their conduct, according to, their, to the, the de- what their deeds deserve. In other words, if I submit myself to the Father and I allow him to cure my heart, my deeds, my speech and deeds begin to match that which God is doing in me. But not until. I can't do this on my own. It is beyond cure. If I trust in my way and my flesh and my flesh is strength, I am cursed. I now need to go to God and allow him to do the work that needs to be done. Here's what's really awesome, though. He promises to do it. So, go to Luke 6, 45 for a moment. Go to Luke 6, 45. So we're going to see what Jesus has to say about this. Okay? Ready? It says, no good tree bears bad fruit. Nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the good, what? Stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored in his heart. For the, for the mouth speaks what the heart is, what? Full, I'm sorry, full of. Now, in your notes, put Proverbs chapter 4 right here because that's a really important passage for this. Proverbs chapter 4. It speaks of what we store in the heart and the necessity to protect the heart and what to protect the heart from, okay? Put that there. So that's Proverbs 4. Read the whole chapter. Let's look at this for a minute, though, in, in terms of the potential dichotomy we have. Remember, what Jesus is speaking here, this is prior to Pentecost. This is prior, essentially, to salvation. He is presenting the kingdom of heaven and the concepts of the kingdom of heaven. And what he is saying here is this. He is making a contrast between the person who will harbor and store evil and the person who will receive what it is that God offers. And then the goodness that begins to flow from the person that receives what God offers is the goodness that, is the goodness that has been placed there by God and then as that person now fills the storehouse with good things. The evil man who harbors sin and evil will continue to speak of the evil, although they can store some good things in there and some will come out. The fact of the matter is the preponderance of the things that they will say, the most of the things that they will say, will reflect the evilness of the heart. Now here's the deal once we're saved. We've been given a new heart. So I want you to keep your fingers here and I want you to go to Ezekiel for a minute. And I have three passages listed, but we're only going to go to one for now and we're going to actually repeat the one that Aaron looked at last week. So go to Ezekiel 36. We're going to start at verse 24. And Ezekiel's in the Old Testament. If you go back to Isaiah, you need to go forward probably, I don't know, maybe six books. If you get to Jeremiah, go forward a couple books. If you get to Lamentations, I think it's the next book. You ready? It says this, it says, for I, this is verse 24, for I will take you out of the nations, I will gather you Israel up. Israel, you have been scattered because of your disobedience and your idolatry. You have blasphemed my name and you've caused my name to be besmirched among the people. I am going to do in you what I need to do to make my name great, to protect my name, to show myself glorious. I will do this thing. Now, what he could have done was he said, listen, I'm going to get rid of you, Israel. I'm going to choose a new people. We're going to start from scratch, and we're going to try again. But what God was doing was revealing both his patience and his mercy, and then his grace toward Israel. And he's saying, you are the one I have chosen, and, and I've given you all these things. You have taken it for granted, and your life is not reflecting the, grace that I, the mercy and the grace that I've shown you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to gather you back from the nations. I'm going to discipline you. And I'm going to cause you to come back to me. And this is how I'm going to do it. Read on. So again, starting in verse 24, it says, 
I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will, sp- I will he says, 20 different times. God either says I will or alludes to what he will do in just this chapter alone. 20 different times. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and I will make you clean. I will cleanse you from your impurities and from all of your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I gave your ancestors and you will be my people, and I will be your God, and I will save you from your uncleanness. This is the promise of God as he looks at this deceitful heart that's beyond cure, this heart that cannot be changed by man himself. And in fact, that, 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 the, the, the attempt for a man to try to change his own heart and his own strength or his own wisdom curses him. God says, I will relieve you of the curse and I will give you a new heart. I will remove the old one and put in a new one. I will give you a spirit that will incline you toward me. This is his promise. Well, this was found in Christ Jesus. That when we receive life, you know, life eternal, forgiveness of sins by placing our faith in Christ, what we have done at that moment is offered ourselves to him in response to his call. He forgives us and dwells us with his spirit makes us part of his family, and then allows us to join him in the privilege of taking the kingdom forward. That's the blessing. That's what happens at salvation. My heart has been replaced. The heart of stone is gone, and the heart of flesh is given to me, and his spirit comes in and indwells me. So the question might be then, well, why in the world do we have to worry about calibrating our heart to God if what, the, what is in us is new and good and reflects God? Hmm. Well, because it's still encased in flesh. It is still that goodness, that righteousness is still encased in flesh. Now I have a theory on this as to why God might do it because we always ask the question, why in the world would God do such a great thing and then leave me in this wretched world in this wretched flesh to be tempted to do the things I shouldn't do? Why? Well, what did Jesus say about his commands? Does anybody remember? He says, the man who has my commands and holds to them is the man who loves me. And I and my Father will come and make our dwelling with him. See, this is what I'm convinced of, <clears throat> that the reason he takes this goodness and righteousness, this new heart, and he ca- encapsulates it in flesh and puts it back in us, it's for us to exercise the choice of the I love you. That when that fleshy part of my heart would choose to, would try and draw me away in the direction that it would want to go, my I love you is to pull my heart back and say, no, I won't go there, God. I will give you myself. God, I will love you. I will say I love you. Does that make sense? And so we're exercising this beautiful opportunity to tell God I love you in the heat of the conflict, in the heat of the temptation, in the heat of the relationship. Isn't that how most of our relationships work anyway? Isn't it when we are most upset with a friend that our love is most tested for that friend? And isn't it when we love that friend through the heat of a conflict that that, that, that love is not only shown but proven and then hardened on the anvil? Isn't that when love is most profound and most deep and most rich? Well, is, wouldn't that also then be true with God? Where do you think that concept comes from here on earth? Well, because it's the very thing that God calls us to with him. And so he gives us beautifully and graciously these wonderful tangible relationships for us to test the theory. Because what did John say? If I can't love Ken who I can see, I can't say that I love God who I can't see. And so what he's saying is the evidence of God in me and my ability to love isn't my that I say I love God, but it's that I can love Brooke through thick and thin. Because if I can love Brooke through thick and thin, then I'll learn to love God through thick and thin. Because Brooke might hurt me once in a while. God hurts me all the time. I, I argue with God constantly. Right? I pray one thing and get another. I pray something, I think he's going to hear me, and I swear he doesn't. I wanted this thing, but he gave me that. Conflict? Right? Hmm. I wanted hair, and he didn't give me any. I didn't want it on my back, but there it is. <laughs> right? I'm mad at God all the time. 
especially when my wife puts, what are they called, flannel sheets on the bed? I'm like a flannel graph. <laughs> if I do this with the sheets, it's a lightning storm underneath. <laughs> That's God's fault. And my wife's. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> I don't, wow, again, welcome to Mosaic. Okay, so... So we read on from there, and it says this. It says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit in you. I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you the heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you and move you, that will move you to follow my decrees and, and be careful to obey my commands. And then you will live in the land that I gave you your ancestors, and you will be my people, and I will be your God, and I will save you from all your uncleanness. That's Jesus. When we say yes to Jesus, that's what we get. That's the promise. So what's happening now is we have this heart that's new and good and righteous, encased in flesh that, what, that has desires of the world, and we have this wonderful conflict inside of us as to decide who it is we're going to love most, God or me. His way or the world's way or my way. That's what it is. And so God is saying, listen, here's the deal. You are righteous and you are holy and you are my child and I love you. Now I want you to show me how much you love me. Walk with me. Isn't that awesome? So we go on. So let's look at the conditions around this. So go to Luke 4, or 647 if you would. I think it's 6. I, I'm going to read it to you because I have a typo, okay? Uh, actually, no, I'm going to skip that one because we get to it later. So go to 2 Corinthians 5. I did the same thing in the 9 o'clock. 2 Corinthians 5. I want us to see something here. We, have, we, we need to understand we've been, now, here, here's one of the things I want us to recognize. Our ability to love well has everything to do with how grateful we are. Um, our ability to love well has everything to do with how grateful we are. How grateful we are has everything to do with how we view God's mercy. And how we view God's mercy has everything to do with how we saw our sinfulness prior to knowing Jesus. Hmm. Hmm. Why might that be? Well, in order for me to truly recognize the mercy that I needed from God, I need to understand just what the depth of my sin was, where I was, and who I was before I knew God. Because I will tell you, in my world, I was a disaster. And I was a disaster in every way, every shape, and every form. And the last thing I deserved was a holy, righteous, good, loving God to die on my behalf. That's the last thing I deserved. I think the work of the faith is to believe in Jesus because it's so hard for us to believe that Jesus could have done what he did without us having to do something for it. Or do something now to maintain it. Or do something now to help him love us more. Or not do something that would cause him to love me less. When in fact, God loves me perfectly all the time. All the time. And that is because of his mercy. Because when Jesus died for me, you know what I didn't do first? Clean up. Start going to church. I didn't all of a sudden, I didn't even stop doing what I was doing. Jesus caught me right in the middle of all my garbage and he said, come here. Yeah, you smell bad. But under all that bad smell, I smell roses. Come here. Yeah, you're ugly, but under all that ugliness, I see beauty. Come here. Yeah, you're, di you're like a dead body, but under all that filth, I smell life. Come here. Let me do something in you. See, I didn't deserve anything Jesus gave me. In fact, what I deserved was what Jesus got because of me. That he would take my punishment is absolutely nuts. In fact, I think it's kind of stupid. It's that, I'd like, what? 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 This righteous, good, loving God who came and bowed his knee to his father and then got on his knee and looked me eye to eye. This wonderful Savior, this incredible God and King and physician and that he would take my punishment from me and then not merely take my punishment but then hand me his righteousness, give me his life, let me be part of his family and invite me into his into his kingdom? And then give me the privilege to extend it? Really? What? Are we in view of his mercy? Do we recognize 
what our desperate need was. Totally depraved and totally deprived and totally desperate with nothing to give. And yet he said, come here. So, go to 2 Corinthians 5 if you would. I want us to see how this works itself out. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says this. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone who has rece- received this life from Jesus, this call, he says, he is a new creation. He's not refurbed, he's not, re- you know, not rehab, nothing, no, no. He is a new creation. He says, the old is past, and behold, the new has come. In fact, in Ephesians 2, it says that we were dead in our trans- transgressions, and he made us alive in Christ. So we were dead, and now we're alive. We were in darkness, and now we're in light. We were in captivity, and now we're free. The old is gone, the new has come. So this is the new heart. This is the, new, the expression of that new heart. And it comes by the mercy of God, despite or in spite of what I was. Go to Second Peter chapter 1. So we have been given, we've, we have this incredible debt that we've been forgiven. And we have this new heart now that we've been given by faith. And next, I want us to see what that does. So go to Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3. And we're going to see what that spirit does. You ready? Now, Ephesians 1 puts it this way, that when we receive the Spirit of God, we received it in such a way as to be a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance and that that power that the Holy Spirit is in us is the same power that God used when he exerted his strength to raise Jesus from the dead. That's the same power that's in us. That's God in us. That's God, the holy God, the mighty God, residing in each one of us who are children of God. Look what it says now. It says, um, it says now, that power. It says his divine power has done what? What's it done for us? Given us what? It gives, it gives us most of what we need, doesn't it? Oh, maybe I'm reading the wrong translation. 99% of what we need? No, it says everything. Everything we need for what? For life and godliness. So for this life that we're called to live and in, 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 in that, that, that will reflect the goodness that is in us, and then his very nature, his very character. So it says, it says, his divine power has given us everything we need for this life and godliness through, our, in our, in, through the context of this relationship we have with Jesus, who called us by his own glory and goodness, his own character and the expression of that character. So the character he places in us is this incredible divine power, this divinity, and the expression of that needs to be goodness just like his is goodness. So he's done that for us. So this heart that we have that is beyond cure, he has cured by giving, not by not curing the old heart, but by removing the old heart and giving us a new. But he doesn't leave that heart just in there beating like that. He puts a spirit next to it to incline us to his word, that we would crave his word and want to get after his word. And doing that, he has made us new creation. So the old is gone and the new has come. And in doing that, he gave us this power, that spirit that he gives us, that he's given us, gives us such power that we can now rise above the corruption caused by evil desires. In other words, it enables us to express the goodness that he's placed in us. That our heart is good and our heart is righteous, but it's wrapped in the old nature. It's wrapped in the flesh. And so that's where the battle lies. So for those of us who have a relationship with God in Christ, when when he says to us then in Ephesians, don't let anything putrid come out of your mouth, that which reflects the old life or the flesh, but instead that which is good for building others up according to their need that it may benefit those who listen, that's the good stuff. And all of this will be determined, listen, all of this will be determined not by what is there because it resides and it resides there permanently. What, what, what comes out of our mouth now will be which one do we indulge? Do we indulge the old man or do we indulge the new? Do we indulge this new heart or do we indulge the flesh that it's wrapped in? And we indulge it, listen, by what we store in it or allowed to be stored in it. The grace of God is when he reveals to us through our mouths, through our attitudes, through our behaviors, or our thoughts and temptations, that which is in our heart that does not reflect the good, the, the, the good nature of God himself. That's grace. Did you know that? You know why? You know what garbage does if you leave it in its storage area? 
it begins to mildew and mold everything, doesn't it? It spreads, it's insidious, it begins to stink, and it, be- and it, and it can't help but do what? Leak out. And so God is saying, I'm going to reveal that to you, not because, not because I want you to feel guilty and ashamed, but because I want you to know I want the best for you, and I, I, and I want my name to be glorified in you, and so I'm going to reveal to you what's there so we can remove it together. Because remember, Jeremiah said, it's beyond cure. I can't do it on my own, but I can with the Holy Spirit's help. And I do that by going to him and saying, what in the world was in there? Help me move it. Does this make sense? And this changes how we talk, and it changes how we behave. This is the transformation of the life of the believer. Of the believer. So, and we do that by this divine power. Now, go to Romans chapter 12, if you would, in verse 1. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. So we've, we have this heart that was beyond cure, but God promises that it will replace it. When Jesus came, he did that, forgiving us of much. Having forgiven us of much, he now, he now has taken the old and thrown it away and given us new, but it's still wrapped in the old so that we are forced to choose the I love you. He, we, we can't do that on our own, but he is, the spirit he's given us has given us a divine power that enables us to do anything that we need to to be able to live this life of godliness. And how do we do that? Romans 12, 1. Ready? And I'm going to go back to this idea of being grateful. Ready? Therefore, Paul says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of what? In view of what? In view of God's mercy, now offer your body as a living sacrifice. Not until. In view of God's mercy, now offer the members of your body to God to accomplish what it is that he longs to accomplish through you. In view of God's mercy, now allow the goodness that is in you by this new heart and the spirit to rise up and come out. Why in view of his mercy? Because we need to remember where we were, what he's done, who has done it, the power that came because of it and our desperate need for him, not only when we were saved, but even now to live. In order for me to do anything right and good, I must first and foremost give all credit to God. It is by his mercy, and only by his mercy. So Paul is saying, in view of God's mercy, now offer your bodies to the living sacrifice. Having recognized that you did not deserve this, recognize your poverty and your depravity. Recognize that it is God who reached down and grabbed and, and held, who has taken the old and replaced it with the new, who has, has given you a spirit and made you good and righteous. He has done this thing in view of his mercy now. So how do we do that? Turn to Philippians, if you would. Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. You ready? We need to recognize then, going back to Jeremiah, that it's not I who does this. It's not I who can do this. I'm cursed if I even try. But God does it. Look what it says here. Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13. It says, work out your salvation. Now, it sounds like that's up to me now, doesn't it? Let's stop right there. Work out your, because how do we usually quote this verse? If you've grown up in church, you've heard this verse, and it says this, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Boop, and we stop right there. And so we're stopped, we were left to think, okay, well, I thought God did that. I thought God saved me. Well, he does say to work out your salvation. Well, does it mean that I have to keep it going all by myself? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Does that mean I should be, the reason I should fear and tremble is because if I don't work it out, I'm going to lose it? Is it possible that maybe I'm not a child of God or maybe I was never really adopted to begin with or maybe the spirit is in me that is, it, maybe it's not permanent? I'm going to stop right there because this is where you usually stop. Does anybody right now, has anybody thought those things when they've heard this verse? Yeah, okay, you know, one, first of all, thank you so much for your honesty, and second of all, let's slay that bugger right now. You know how we slay a lie? We take it to the truth. Let me say that again. You know how you slay a lie? You take it to the truth. Mmm! 
Remember, if we do this in our own strength, we're cursed. The reason you feel the way you do right now, having stopped in the middle of that verse, and if for some reason you've grown up in church and you've heard that verse, and it's always stopped right there, and inside you're afraid to ask the question because nobody else is asking the question, does that mean, and you walk away wondering, what in the world do I do now? Let me teach you how to kill a lie. Keep reading. Look what it says. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 13, and it's not even a second sentence. It's just a comma. For it is God who works. It is God who works. It is God who saves. It is God who sustains it. It is God who takes my old heart and replaces it with a new one. It is God who puts a spirit in me that inclines me to his word. It is God who wrote the word that guides me along that path. It is God's spirit of God, being God in me, that allows me to be on that path. Did I just wake a baby up? I'm sorry. Does this make sense? And then all of a sudden we have somebody tell us, well, now you work out your salvation. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'd be working it out like three times a day trying to figure out, did I lose it? Did I keep it? Did I lose it? Did I keep it? Did I lose it? Did I keep it? I'm tired. Let's call the whole thing off, which I think is a song. Okay, so. No, it says that it's God who works. It is God who works in you to will and to act. It is God who works. You know what he's saying is join God in the work. He says, as you work this thing out with him, it is God who does the work. We join him in the work. That's what he means by, in Peter, when it says, make every effort now. God has given you everything you need. Now you join him with the effort. God is doing the work. Now you join him in the work. This is an incredible privilege to join the author of our faith. This is an incredible privilege to join the missionary on mission, the servant in serving, the lover in loving, the king in kinging. Isn't this amazing? But we've hurt ourselves by not reading the entire context. And we need to recognize that what God is saying is, listen, I will do this, and I have done this, and I'm gonna continue to do it. You join me. And how we allow goodness to come out of our mouths and out of our eyes and through our hands and through our deeds is not by our human effort. But it's by joining God in his work and recognizing what he's done and linking ourselves to him by that spirit. And then allowing when something comes up to say it, take it back to him. He says, I will examine your heart and I will examine your mind. I'll show you. That's what he means by that in Jeremiah. I'll do that. You can't do it, but I'll do it for you. And I will show you the things that don't reflect me and then I'm going to give you everything you need to do to get rid of it. And I will join you in it. Isn't that beautiful? But that's not what we've been taught in many cases. That's how gracious our God is. That's how loving our God is. That's how faithful our God is. That's how wonderful this thing is. And if we're going to speak the truth in love, then what we need to do is know how to handle what's going on inside of us. That battle that rages between the good and the righteousness that is in us and the flesh that is wrapped in. The desires of God versus our own desires. And not just suppressing them and storing them for later, but in fact presenting them to the Father and say, I'm not sure where this came from. Can we please deal with this? You've examined my heart and you've revealed this to me. Here, take it, please. Does this make sense? And replace it with truth. So, if we go on. So go back to 2 Peter, if you would. So what are we going to do? We need to develop this heart of gratitude. We need to recognize what it is to be grateful. But in order to do that, we need to remember that we're forgiven. If we're going to remember we're forgiven, we need to be re- remember what we're forgiven from and that that forgiveness is based on the mercy of God, not anything that I've done, right? So 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, he says this. Remember, he's already said in verse 3, he's given us everything we need because he's given us everything we need. And we, this is by God's power and his glory and his goodness and his promises. He says, for this reason, make every effort to add to your faith now goodness. 
Or you can, if we put Paul and Peter together, this is what it sounds like. For this very reason, because God has done these great things, and you can't do it yourself, so he'll do it for you. Just join him in the effort. Make every effort to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's what he's saying. Paul shows us, generally speaking, how it is, it is to look. Peter then starts to break it down in terms of what we need to do. So look what it says. It says, now add to your faith, oddly enough, goodness. In other words, allow that goodness that God has made you to be to come out. Add to your goodness more knowledge. Know more about God. Add to that new knowledge this ability to be self-controlled. And really, self-control has to do with settling one's inside so that you can pray effectively. Praying effectively allows you to persevere or cheerfully endure your circumstances. Add to that perseverance godly character as Jesus is formed in you. As Jesus is formed formed in you, guess what happens? You begin to love the brotherhood. Well, why? Well, because Jesus is the head and we're the body. And we're united and we begin to connect. And as you learn to love the brotherhood, what happens next? You learn to agape. You learn to love without reason. Look what it goes on to say, though. For if you possess these qualities in what? What's it say? What's it say? In increasing measure. It'll keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your relationship with Jesus. Now this is really important. Remember, what we're trying to do is develop a grateful heart because in order for us to truly love well, we need to be grateful. And the only way we're grateful is we recognize what our need was and that our need was met by God expressing his love through mercy, a time when we didn't deserve it, and the depth of forgiveness and the debt that was paid for us. Right? Look what it says now. It says, if you have these in increasing measure, it will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But, but whoever does not have them is what? Nearsighted and what? Blind and has done what? Has done what? Has done what? Forgotten that they were forgiven of their sins. Guess what they've done? They've lost sight of God's mercy. They have forgotten. You ever sometimes forget that you're forgiven of your sins? You just kind of take it for granted? You ever forget what it is that God has done to, to, to bring you into his family? Do we ever, for, do we ever, do, do anybody here ever forget? Well, see, when we forget, what happens is we don't realize that we have, the things we see rise up from our hearts and in our mouths and in our minds. We don't realize that what we really need to do with that is not just stuff it down and restore it to be unfortunately used later but that that's our opportunity to bring it to a loving God to say to him, here, I need forgiveness. What? I need forgiveness. I need it. Not for salvation, but for your glory. Not for salvation, because you've already done that, but for, for a life of fruitfulness. Does this make sense? What we need to do is plant our tree next to the streams, not in the salt plains. We need to approach this recognizing that there's nothing we can do about it, but we have a Father who can, and we need to run to him with everything we have. You know, when we were little kids and we got hurt, what would we do? Did we go and get a first aid kit and, you know, make sure that it was all washed out and rinse it out and, and decide whether or not it needs a suture or a butterfly band-aid or just a regular band-aid? What did we do? What did we do? We grabbed it and we what? We ran to our parents. We ran to our father. We ran to our mother. Why? Because we knew there was nothing we could do. And how did our parents treat us most of the time if we had a decent relationship with our parents? Oh, sweetie, come here. Put them on their knee, kiss the boo-boo, clean it out, tend to it, check it again. Remember, we serve a good father. And when things come up out of our heart that don't belong there, that's, that is, in essence, a wound but we try to hide it and take care of it ourselves. We try to bandage it with filthy band-aids and we, we try to pack, no, run to dad. Run to the father. Let him suture it. Let him clean it out. Let him heal it. Let him remove the dirt so there's no infection. That makes sense? See, that's what our father wants. That's how it is that a heart that still has stuff in it that needs to come out, that's how we get it out. 
Not by hoarding it, storing it, hiding it, pretending it didn't happen, wishing it wouldn't have happened. No, ignoring it. The psalmist says, listen, when I, when I, when I kept silent, my bones were crushed. But then I remembered and I came to you and I, I, and I gained relief. This is what our Father wants. And we will reflect our Father when we conduct ourselves this way. Does this make sense? I want to read one story. Please, this is what I'd like you to do. Take the notes home. There's tons of scripture here. Read it. The, where I want to end this today, because we're running out of time, um, even though the bills don't start till four, I'll let you go. Um, I want you to go to Luke chapter seven. Do we have time to read two passages? Is that okay? Can we read two? Because I want us to see a contrast. Um, no, nope. No, I think we've done enough of that. Let's go to Luke 7. Let's just go to Luke 7. You can read the other stuff at home, which is good for you anyway. So here we go. We're at verse 36. And this is the idea of recognizing, recognizing the need, our need for mercy, what that mercy has done. And that our love will be commensurate to our recognition of what it is, how it is we've been forgiven. And this will help us know why. This will help us know why we speak the way we do. It says, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner. Now, do me a favor. You know, a lot of times we see the black letters and we think the black letters are just there for, for window dressing. Listen, the black letters are Jesus' words as much as the red letters are, number one. Number two is the black letters give, give framework and context to the red letters. And this is really what I want us to get out of these black letters today. Don't, I want you to look at the setting. Look at the setting, because there are nuances in the setting that actually frame what Jesus teaches. You ready? Here we go. It says, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house. This is a teacher of the law. And he reclined at the table. It says, a woman in that town lived a, who lived a sinful life. Now, we presume that that is prostitution. Okay. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she took a risk, and she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, Jesus, she began to wet his feet with her tears. When she wiped, and then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Now when the Pharisee had invited, who, who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, which I think is ironic, because it says that the Pharisee thought this to him, what? Self. Oh. So Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which one of them will love him more? Which one of them will do what? Love him more. Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me water for my feet, which was just customary, just a courtesy. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss which was a customary greeting. But this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head to refresh me or call me honored. But she poured perfume on my feet. Look at verse 47. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. As great as her great love shown 
But whoever has been forgiven little, what? Loves little. See, if we lose sight of God's mercy, when we forget the debt that was paid for us, when we forgive, the, when we forget the depth of forgiveness that we have needed and have received, when we don't recognize the sinfulness in which we resided, when we don't see the death that we once resided in and the life that we have received in, 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 in exchange, we will love little. And when we love little, we'll have difficulty with our speech, with our deeds, with our attitudes and our actions. Because Aaron was right when he spoke last week. It was never a word issue. It was a heart issue. See, Jesus has made us new. He has given us a new heart and a spirit. Band, go ahead and get in place if you would. A new heart and a spirit and an attitude and the truth. And he has given us everything we need to live this life in a way that reflects his kingdom, his grace, his mercy as we have experienced it. Please go home and read the rest of the scripture. Let us calibrate our hearts with God's truth, with Jesus' heart. And may we, instead of restoring all the things that we thought we were having self-control over, take that into the closet and reveal it to Jesus and say, here it is. I'm sorry. I didn't know it was there. Help me with it. Forgive me. Amen? Let's, well, let me <laughs> talk for a minute. we we'll wait for the band to get ready. <laughs> How you doing, buddy? Let's stand and sing.
see you that you've already placed in us to begin to emerge and to present to you the things that are contrary to you that you, Lord God, would remove them and continue to conform us in the likeness of Jesus. <clears throat> Not merely our character, but the expressions of that character, goodness, service, and love and mercy. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. We'll see you next week.